Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where I break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 52, The Kill Box. The party has wound up in a fight with a bunch of barbarians and druids in the center of Westron's town square, and we are going to have a lot to talk about today. In fact, there was so much to talk about surrounding this episode that Matt Mercer actually went live on Periscope the day after the stream and offered some insight into how the game went. I really want to thank the channel Critical Scope for saving all these old Periscopes and uploading them to YouTube. They are a huge help. And because of that, we have a very unusual amount of information about what Matt was thinking behind the scenes of this episode. So buckle up, because this one is going to be a doozy. Before we begin, I have a quick announcement. Uh, my day job has actually ended as of the beginning of this month. I knew this was a possibility. It was a startup. There was always a chance my role wasn't going to be permanent. Uh, it, it's a bummer, but it actually gives me a chance to try something that I've been wanting to do for a while. I'm going to try to go full time again, but this time I'm going to do some more live streaming. By the time you're watching this, my goal is to have started streaming Baldur's Gate 3 pretty regularly. I haven't played the game yet on my own time, I've been waiting to do it live on the stream. So if that's something you want to see, then check out those VODs and hang out in the live streams, those are a ton of fun. And again, I just really appreciate the incredible support of this audience, you all mean the absolute world to me. In fact, along those same lines, I received a couple of gifts off of my Amazon wishlist. Uh, Christopher K sent me the Fantasy Map Maker Guide for Drawing Cities for Gamers and Fans, and the Ultimate RPG Quest Keeper. I've been wanting to review both of these for a while, and I'm going to look forward to doing those on the show. Christopher K. actually specifically said that they were looking forward to this episode specifically, so uh, I think it was very appropriate that they arrived just in time for this one. Um, someone also sent me Masks, A New Generation. I loved playing this game. I really want to run this game. And uh, Amazon did not give me the name. They didn't include any of the paperwork that normally comes with a gift uh, or with the package at all. So so uh, if you're the one who got me this copy of Masks, please let me know, because I really want to thank you for that as well. Um, now, on with the show. Now here's a fun fact. This episode opens with a new sponsor. They'd been sponsored by Wormwood Gaming for a while, but now they were also being sponsored by Loot Crate for a full month. And so the cast members all open their Loot Crate boxes at once while Matt reads the ad copy, and it's immediately chaos. They're so excited about what they got, but Matt can't get a word in edgewise. You know what they need? They need one cast member to just read the ad copy, like Liam does with Wormwood. One cast member who can be their, their spokesperson for their advertisers. I think one of them could do that job really well. Oh, I don't know. That's a lot of responsibility. You'd have to come up with a new ad every week, and you might start to go a little bit crazy trying to come up with new creative ways to entertain the audience. Eh, I guess we'll see what they figure out. Matt opens the game by recapping the story so far, and here's an interesting moment already. During his recap, Matt refers to the tenuous alliance between the members of the River Maw tribe and the Herd of Storms. As a reminder, Grog grew up in the Herd of Storms, which is made up entirely of Goliaths, but the River Maw tribe includes a bunch of other types of people. Now, I don't think the party had really internalized the idea that there was any sort of tension there. In fact, I'm not sure any tension had actually been foreshadowed or established, except Maybe when Grog was walking to the town square. He was being escorted by some River Maw folks, but they weren't exactly slagging off Kevdak. But here, Matt is kind of slipping this important exposition into the recap, because it is important information that the party is going to need to know, regardless of whether or not there was a previous scene to establish it. Anyway, after Matt finishes his recap, he's right about to switch to the battle music, but Sam jumps in with a quick contribution. Before we go, yes, I have to inspire everyone. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here! What? When did you do what, that? Are you? what are you? What the fuck are you? Oh my god! Where? I want a D10. Look, look, Ashley's like <laughs> somewhere. I can't even see her. She's on your way. Oh my god! Oh. Oh. Please tell me that was a gift from somebody. No, I made this myself. <laughs> I wanted you all to know how passionate I was about tonight. Legendary. What a perfect thing to wear when the party all gets murdered by Goliaths. But the party did try to rig the game in their favor. Right before the game, they had Will Wheaton come and touch a bunch of Matt's stuff to transmit his dice curse onto Matt. So now Matt clicks on the battle music and reacquaints the players with the battlefield. It looks like he's expanded the battlefield to include more of the buildings around the town square, although maybe those were already there and we just have a better camera angle this time to show off more of the map. He also put some red rings down to mark who the innocent civilians are, because remember, the herd pulled a bunch of civilian hostages out of their homes so they could use them as leverage to help avoid exactly this scenario, a bunch of heroes attacking them without consequence. And the party rolls for initiative, and normally I would just cover the highlights of the battle, 
But we have so many lessons to cover in this fight that I want to try something different. Welcome to the Battle of Westron! We're going to give you all the coverage you need for your favorite bloody battle for the future of an entire city. Let's get those initiative scores on the board! By the way, if you want to see a method to share initiative results with your players, uh, check out my video about initiative tents. It's a good one! Round 1. Fight! Now, Matt declares that most of the bad guys are surprised, except for four guys with clubs, two ladies with swords, and Kevdak. Now, this is interesting, because I figured when Grog shouted, fuck shit up, that that was a clear sign to everyone that something was going on. But Matt also knows that the cast has a bunch of stuff prepared, and it would be absolute chaos to have everybody take a readied action and then roll initiative. So he says some foes are surprised. Now, some of the bad guys aren't surprised, and I don't know how he determined who did manage to clock Box Mach in his presence before those readied actions would have gone off. Matt did describe that some of the bad guys looked around and spotted a few members of Vox Machina on the rooftops, but that could be because they had high perception skills, or it could be because they just had the best line of sight. We don't really know why each enemy is or is not surprised. When we get to Kevdak's turn, Matt will tell us that Kevdak can't see any of the other members of Vox Machina, but maybe Kevdak isn't surprised because he's the main bad guy, and it would suck if he was incapacitated for an entire round. I mean, can you imagine if Kevdak went an entire round without getting to take an action? Vex casts Hunter's Mark on Kevdak, but holds her attack until Scanlet's turn. Vax clicks his boots and holds his attack until either the magic users pull it out a trick or Kevdak swings at Grog. Kevdak goes next, he rolls a natural 20 to attack Grog. Thanks, Will Wheaton. But Vax does not take his attack. He'd rather wait for something else. Kevdak scores two hits on Grog, but on Kevdak's second attack, Scanlan uses cutting words to reduce the damage. But he is just out of range. So Matt offers Sam a choice. Does he want to take a step forward and break his cover in order to reduce this damage? This is an interesting offer. I like it a lot. The party had the choice to place themselves where they wanted in the last session when they were watching this battle unfold, but they weren't counting squares, and spellcasters would know how far away they need to be to do their cool magic. However, Matt isn't having Sam retcon where he was placed, although he could and that would be fine. Instead, he's asking if Scanlan wants to move, to give up his cover in order to do what he wants to do right now. He's asking Sam if he wants to be more vulnerable in order to do a cool thing. And that's a great offer. Do you want to give something up to do something cool is a really great question because it forces the players to make a choice and decide where their priorities lie. In this case, Scanlan takes the deal. He moons Kevdak, that's how he flavors his cutting words in this case, and he reduces the damage by one hit point. However, because he's wielding Myth Carver, the bard-specific vestige of divergence, Kevdak's next saving throw is at disadvantage because he was the target of Scanlan's cutting words, which is why it was so important to Scanlan to use cutting words on Kevdak so early in the fight. Kevdak points up at Scanlan, and all these archers take aim at him as well, although they're still surprised this round and their turn already passed, so it seems like they have him as their target for the next round. I appreciate that as well. It's nice of Matt to add flavor and foreshadowing so Sam knows how he should behave before the archer's next turn. Scanlan acts next, and at the top of his turn, he asks Matt if there are enemies who don't have weapons, and if they're wielding a staff instead. Matt points out two, Greenbeard and one other, who both have a staff, but they are also both surprised this round. Scanlan casts Hold Person at level 3 on Kevdak and Greenbeard. Thanks to the disadvantage, Kevdak rolls a 10, and his body freezes up, one arm still pointed at Scanlan, the other holding his axe in front of his chest, because that's how Matt was positioned at the end of Kevdak's last turn. Greenbeard rolls a 1 and fails his saving throw as well. The other players are also all very quick to confirm that attacking Kevdak won't end the paralysis, which is really important to clarify, but no, they're in the clear. And so the twins unleash their held attacks on Kevdak. This was Scanlan's plan. It didn't matter how much damage he took off with cutting words, all that mattered was using it on Kevdak, so he would have disadvantage on this saving throw. And it changed everything. Now, it almost seems Scanlan chose Greenbeard as a lark, at least that was Matt's theory when he discussed this session the following day, but Watching the episode, Sam was clearly looking for a spellcaster to target, and Greenbeard was both a spellcaster and the only other named NPC on the field, so it does seem like he was an obvious choice. I don't think Sam thought it would work on him, because he probably knew Greenbeard's wisdom score was going to be pretty high, but I don't think he cared that much, because his primary target was Kevdak. However, Matt revealed the next day that Greenbeard's initial tactic was to cast Sunbeam and go into Earth Elemental form, basically running around the battlefield with a consistent beam of energy like Iron Man. So getting this whole person off on both of them was a game changer. Scanlan then ducks behind cover because he knows those archers are gunning for him next. Now, like I mentioned, at this point, Vex and Vax unleash their readied attacks. Now, Vax goes to use his bonus action for another attack, but Matt explains that holding your turn actually just means readying your action, so Vax would have lost his bonus action if he didn't use it on his turn. Liam asks if he can still move, and Matt says, 
sure, yeah, why not? But he clarifies that technically Vax shouldn't have any movement, but Matt is allowing him to do so. Because Matt knows it's not Liam's fault that he doesn't understand readied actions, because they've been running it wrong for more than 50 episodes. For most of this campaign so far, at least what we've seen on screen, they've been using rules for holding your entire turn, or they've been running some weird hodgepodge of those rules and the 5e rules for readied actions. Here it seems like Matt has learned how readied actions work in 5e, and more importantly, why they work that way, because holding your turn does not work in 5e because of the way spell durations work. So he's trying to clarify it for the group and enforce those rules going forward. However, because he didn't clarify this on Vax's turn when he first held his action, he's not going to completely punish Liam in the middle of his turn when Liam might have made a different choice on his turn if he'd fully understood the rule. Which again, that's not anyone's fault. Matt has so many versions of the game floating around in his head that it's going to take him a while to adapt to 5e, so of course there's going to be a learning curve for his players as well, especially when his players refined their combat strategies in a completely different game system. Also, it's worth noting that Kevdak is still taking half damage from all attacks. Theoretically, they could wait a round to attack him, and then all their attacks would deal max damage the following round, but they don't know how long the hold person spell will last, and they have a more specific goal in mind. On Grog's turn, he pulls the Blood Axe out of Kevdak's hands and takes a swing at Kevdak's arm to cut his left arm off at the elbow to remove the gauntlet. Matt rules that this is basically a called shot, something that is more common in Pathfinder but is not at all how 5th edition works. In D&D, you don't really target specific parts of the body with your attacks. However, the entire reason Vox Machina is crossing blades with Kevdak at all is because they want what he's got. They're here for these gauntlets. It also helps that, given he's twice the size he normally would be, each arm would be a meatier, more obvious target. So Matt rules, okay, it's going to be a minus 5 to the attack. That's not quite how it worked in Pathfinder, but basically Matt just stole the rules for partial cover because that's a decent approximation of trying to target a small part of someone's body. Grog also isn't attuned to this axe, but the attack has advantage and it's an automatic crit. Now, he doesn't do a ton of damage, but more importantly, Matt has to decide how much damage these arms can reasonably take. And I don't envy him, that's a tough judgment call to make, especially because Kevdak is enlarged, so his arms would be beefier, but also, Kevdak is taking half damage from everything, so that impacts how much health would be reasonable to give the arms before it stops being fun. Matt has to decide on a number that is both reasonable and dramatic. And it's going to matter a lot in this fight, because other people are also going to target those arms. We come to Percy's turn, and he starts unloading into the pointing right arm at the elbow. And here it seems Matt actually gives Percy disadvantage on the attack, which is an understandable way to handle called shots, since disadvantage in 5e is meant to replace all those floating modifiers. But Matt also says the attack should be at minus 5, because I think he feels that it should be really hard to cut off these arms, which I can understand, don't know if I agree, but... I can understand where he's coming from. However, Talison had already said that it was a sharpshooter shot, so he thinks that the minus five that Matt was talking about was the sharpshooter bonus. Really, it should have been a minus 10 to Talison's attack rolls. It didn't really matter. Percy rolled a natural 20. The next two attacks were really high as well. He deals a total of 79 damage to the elbow, leaving it dangling from a single sinew. Now remember, Kevdak is still raging, so all that damage is still halved, so Kevdak only took about 38 points of damage to his supersized arm. I don't know if Matt decided that 40 damage would cut the arm off, or if he's just feeling it out to see what seems right in the moment, but either way, the arm is not quite off, but it's certainly not going to be usable anytime soon. Jesus, we are four lessons into this video, and we have not even finished the first round of combat, and most of these combatants are surprised and aren't even going to act this round. Keyleth is still an air elemental, and she flies onto the roof of a building and attacks the archers, throwing one of them off of the roof. Pike summons a spiritual weapon in the form of a sword, and Matt narrates that it looks like a light reflection mirror image of Craven Edge, which is a really nice touch. Again, she rolls a natural 20 to hit Kevdak, not aiming for his arm, but just unloading damage into Kevdak. However, she then falls off the roof and lands prone next to some herd members. And then some of the herd members go into a rage, which allows them to no longer be surprised this round. So that's probably why Matt was so willing to declare that many of these bad guys were surprised, because it actually wasn't going to matter when he got to their turns. Pike gets hit with a few attacks, and Grog gets attacked by three bad guys with two attacks each. Both Pike and Grog are starting to get kind of low on hit points, actually. Round two. Okay, one more just like that, and we'll be in good shape. Vex rolls another natural 20 on Kevdak. I'm not going to recap every attack in this fight, but that felt noteworthy. There have been a lot of natural 20s in this episode. However, I want to highlight something that I think is interesting. Just before Liam's turn, Talison says that this is an incredible battle map. Now, I agree. I think it's fantastic. However, if we just look at the layout of it, it's kind of still just an arena. Now, there are alleys and houses people can hide within, or trees they can hide behind, and there's these spiky barricades in the center, but beyond that, there's not really a ton of elements of the environment for the characters to interact with. Except there is one aspect that really elevates the map, pun intended. 
This map has a lot of verticality. That's why on his turn, Vax is able to knock a bad guy off the roof and send him spilling into the street. It's costing him one of his attacks, but it's still a fun way for the characters to interact with the space and make creative choices. He's on the same building as Keyleth, but he's one floor below, which means Keyleth was also pushing someone off of this same building, but from a higher surface. They're in the same place, but they're also not. So there's some really good stuff happening here with this map. And look, at the end of the day, this is still just a game. If your battle map is effectively still just an empty arena, but your players think that the map looks cool, that in and of itself might be just enough of a reward. But I know that, speaking personally, I could stand to learn a lot from this. I could incorporate a lot more verticality into my battle maps. Okay, let's summarize some of this next section. The archers start shooting at Percy and Pike. Thankfully, Percy can catch one of those arrows with his gloves of missile snaring. Good thing they had a low-stakes orc fight a few episodes ago, so Taliesin could remember that he had those gloves. Kevdak rolls an 18 to save against the hold person, but thanks to the hand cone of clarity, Scanlan's spell save DC is 20. This is the product of converting Pathfinder characters into 5e characters with all their magic items basically doing the same things, but the specific math doesn't matter. The point is, the party got yet another lucky roll. Kevdak is still frozen. Scanlan heals Pike a bit and also blasts the town square with a level 5 fireball from his wand of fireballs. Even though Kevdak auto fails the saving throw, he still takes half damage from the fire because he is a totem of the bear barbarian. He's resistant to all damage besides psychic. And can you imagine how tough this fight would be if Kevdak was an opponent instead of basically a MacGuffin? Speaking of which, Grog swings again and manages to fully cut off Kevdak's left arm, the one that Percy could not target because it was in front of Kevdak's chest on the other side from where Percy is. Grog also takes a superior healing potion on his turn, which, by the way, is the highest level potion they've got. Fun fact, I'm pretty sure that's the highest level healing potion we've ever seen on Critical Role. I'm a year behind on Campaign 3, but from what I recall from the first two campaigns and the first 40 or so episodes of Campaign 3, I don't think Matt has ever given his players a supreme healing potion. Maybe he doesn't like that level of healing being available, or... Maybe he doesn't like the scaling of the healing makes no sense at all, and it's really hard to remember. Like, a healing potion is 2d4 plus 2, a greater is 4d4 plus 4, a superior is 8d4 plus 8, and a supreme is 10d4 plus 20? What? Weird. Anyway, that may not be why, but I couldn't blame him if it was. At the end of Greenbeard's turn, he manages to break out of the hold person spell. More on that later. Percy's gun jams. Keyleth starts mixing it up with the archers on the rooftops. Pike runs around the corner and heals herself because she is not doing well. The one who attacked Pike follows her around the corner and hits her with a natural 20. And Grog gets hit with another 5 hits and one natural 20. Look, I get there are going to be a lot more dice rolls in this fight, so of course there are going to be more natural 20s. But, jeez, he peats, that's a lot of crits. Another spellcaster tries to cast a healing spell on Kevdak, but Scanlan counterspells it. Once again, Scanlan is the MVP of this fight. At this point, a bunch of herd members who were surprised get to take their first turn. More bad guys start rushing at Pike and Grog since they're at street level. One of them also starts going after these civilian hostages, getting ready to shove one of them into the flaming barricade on their next turn. Another goon climbs up the side of a building and goes after Scanlan, and a few cast members protest. They ask how he got up there so fast. And before Matt can reply, Laura answers, they can roll acrobatics just like we can. Matt replies basically at the same time, kind of says the same thing. He says, you guys can do it, they can do it too. But I think this is noteworthy because not only is this a good philosophy to have for your games, but also if you stick to that philosophy for long enough and you play enough and you continue to play fair and stay consistent in your rulings, then your players will internalize these rules. And so they can answer that question before you even get a chance. Thankfully, these guys who were surprised the first round and are now taking their turn, the uh, blade storms, as Matt calls them, well, they don't have nearly as high of an attack modifier, so they're not landing every hit like some of those other bad guys were. But also, Matt does something nice here. As these bad guys cut into Grog, Matt is actually reducing the damage in half before he tells it to Travis. Grog takes half damage from all these attacks anyway, so Matt does not give him the full amounts and then leave it to Travis to do the math. Because it's just easier that way. It makes the math a lot simpler. It means the players don't hear multiple different numbers for the same attack and potentially get confused about which one is the final damage. And it means they have to do less math on their side. And that just makes the game go a lot faster. One bad guy does make it to Scanlan and starts swinging, but Scanlan maintains his concentration on the hold person spell. Round three. Holy shit, this is getting real. On her turn, Vex flies out the window and taps Grog with the locket, Raven slumber, and puts Grog into the locket. He's at like four hit points. She's trying to medevac him out and save his life. And it works. She does take five attacks of opportunity from the dudes who were flanking Grog, four of those hit, and she's doing pretty rough now. But thank god Kevdak was still held, because taking an attack of opportunity from him would not be pretty. Actually, right now he only has half of one arm and no weapon, so maybe he wouldn't be the worst threat right now. She flies away to the roof, she's hurt, but she's alive, and Grog is safe. Matt also clarified the next day. If Vex had been cut down, she would have died. If she hadn't saved Grog, 
he would have died. Not, oh, they're at zero hit points, let's leave them alone. The herd members would have unleashed hell on their unconscious forms and cut them to ribbons. Vax closes in on Kevdak and gives him an appendectomy and then darts away. Matt also rules at this point that the archers have figured out that Scanlan cast the spell on Kevdak. I mean, when a gnome moons your boss and he freezes in place and then that same gnome launches a fireball, it's safe to assume that he's a spellcaster. Whether or not he's the source of this spell that's freezing Kevdak in place, it's never a bad strategy to target the spellcasters. Scanlan gets hit with five attacks but maintains concentration until the fifth attack. And with that, Kevdak is free. On his turn, Kevdak can't pick anything up, but he tells one guy to pick up Grog's hammer and commands a few other combatants to kill some innocents. Scanlan unloads another fifth level fireball into the courtyard, and at first he wants to angle it so he doesn't hit the innocent on the field, but then he realizes that that would hit Vax instead. So he chooses to target the innocent instead of Vax. Now Vax would take a lot less damage from the fireball thanks to the rogue's evasion feature. In fact, he probably would have taken no damage, but Sam probably didn't realize that. But more importantly, both Sam and Scanlan want to protect Vax. So this is something that drew some criticism. The other cast members protested at the time, and Matt fielded questions the next day from folks asking if Scanlan was going to get an alignment change. But Matt clarified that one act does not signal an alignment change. That comes with repeated behavior, and Matt says that he is going to keep an eye on this to see if he thinks Scanlan is role-playing another alignment besides neutral good. Now, I've already talked about the last time Matt had to change a player character's alignment and how that did not go the way he might have expected due to a miscommunication and expectations, which led to a lot of resentment because, in my opinion, Matt didn't make sure his player understood his argument, and he just changed the player's alignment unilaterally to one that the player didn't agree with or agree to. But in this case, a conversation is being had, but Sam has a rationale. And this will come up in the next episode, because Sam and Scanlan both have an internal logic here. Whether or not it's defensible isn't the same as believing that Scanlan believes it, and had an argument for why he would do what he did. But again, we'll talk more about that next time. Anyway, the innocent villager dies in the fire, and believe it or not, he's the first person to die in this fight. No one else has been killed yet on either side of the battle. And it turns out a second villager was also in range, so he is also incinerated. Hooray! Also, this isn't plot relevant or strategy relevant. I just love this exchange. You have some plan or something, right? I mean, who the fuck knows if that's gonna fucking work? <laughs> <laughs> on Greenbeard's turn, he casts Heal on Kevdak, which Scanlan tries to counterspell and fails. So Kevdak heals 70 hit points, re knitting his elbow together and undoing a lot of Vox Machina's hard work. Because remember, he heals full hit points and takes half damage. So they have to hit him for at least another 140 hit points to get him back to where he was. And then Greenbeard turns into an Earth Elemental on his bonus action because he's a Circle of the Moon Druid just like Keyleth. Kevdak also calls out for someone to go get the other severed arm on the ground. Percy goes after Kevdak with bad news, dealing almost 50 damage. And that's the total after the damage was halved. So they're making good progress. But the cast is definitely feeling the effects of this intense fight. 23 to hit. That hits. Ah. Um... <laughs> I don't feel good. Oh. <laughs> I have the worst headache right now. Um, I feel really bad right now. I don't feel. I don't feel. I don't feel happy. Any other trick shots you're gonna use, or um, dead, dead shot? Anything you want to use? This is heroic death music right now. I hate this music you're playing. Um, you can switch it up if you want. No, no. No, it's uh, fine. Uh, asshole, asshole, asshole. <laughs> That's better. Asshole, asshole, asshole. Um, just dead eye as well, or just regular? Um, I know. I feel like I should have worn more deodorant. Uh, this maybe. is this is sharpshooter as well. No dead eye. Okay, um, sharpshooter, go for the shot. I think I've got some in my purse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what if we all I'm die and we the dragons leaving. just take over everything? No, no. You know, it's this kind of intense fun that you can get in every loot court. <laughs> 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 uh, you. Every month, you'll be on pins and needles to see what's in this box. <laughs> Keyleth drops out of her elemental form and casts her seventh level spell, Firestorm. Again, Kevdak takes half damage, but he's back where he was before the heal spell in just two player turns. Nice work, Vox Machina, unloading 140 hit points worth of damage. And an archer dies. A bad guy archer. It just took them more than two hours in real life to kill one of their enemies with like more than a dozen on the board. Not a great sign. Pike comes up with a great way to deal with the four bad guys around her. She casts command on all of them to attack each other on their turns and three of them fail that save. So this is gonna work. That's actually such a good plan. I'm really impressed by that. And then she tries to roll out of this huddle and Matt goes to the player's handbook to look up something about attacks of opportunity. Cutting to the chase, she does wind up taking an attack of opportunity. She's down to 15 hit points. But as Matt was looking up whatever he needed to reference in the book, a bunch of the cast members started basically trying to convince Matt that this should work because it's just a somersault past some bad guys. But Sam chimes in, let the DM DM. Matt says the same thing. He says, let me deal with it, guys. 
But Sam said the same thing, and I think this is a really interesting lesson. See, there is a lot of haggling and bartering and negotiating that happens at this table, where Matt will wonder about something or imply that something might not work, and a bunch of the cast members will try to convince him that, yes, actually, it will work. Now, some of this is perfectly reasonable, because the players might just be reminding Matt of a rule. Because no human being can hold all the rules for this game in their head, especially during a complex battle like this. Sometimes the players might just be clarifying what they thought was going to happen, because especially if it seems like Matt didn't understand what the player was trying to do, that difference might really matter. But sometimes this bartering and negotiating happens just because the players aren't happy with the outcome, or because they just don't want something bad to happen. And unfortunately, it's often really difficult to tell the difference. But at this point, I think Sam does spot the difference. There's nothing really that any of the other players are arguing that changes Matt's potential ruling, other than they want Pike to be okay. And like, yeah, of course they all want Pike to be okay. Matt wants Pike to be okay. But wanting that does not necessarily make it so in this game. And so yeah, since none of them actually have a specific rule they're referencing that would make a difference, I think that that was a really good interjection and intervention from Sam. But also, I wanna be clear. This does not mean that every attempt to negotiate is bad. For example, at the end of Pike's turn, Matt says that Pike could move further, but she would potentially take more attacks of opportunity. And Liam and Laura both say, well, wait, hang on, aren't they all going to attack each other thanks to Pike's spell? Why would they attack her now? And that's a reasonable clarification. They thought this spell had overridden the willpower of these enemies, which means Pike wouldn't have to worry about most of these guys anymore. And Matt clarifies that the spell doesn't actually take effect, it doesn't change their behavior until the start of their turn. But that is a totally reasonable question and clarification, and there is nothing wrong with Liam and Laura stepping in and asking a question like that to make sure that everyone is on the same page and that everyone's being treated fair. And yeah, sure, it's still a form of bartering and haggling from the players, but I don't think that's the problem. The problem is when some of these players are negotiating not because they believe Matt's ruling is incorrect, but instead just to influence him to rule in their favor. And that's what most of those players were doing earlier in Pike's turn, which is why I'm really glad that Sam pointed out that they should just let Matt figure out the answer rather than petition him to look kindly on them. Now at this point, as more of the bad guys act, some of them start killing civilians, because Kevdak commanded them to do so on his turn. And it seems like the bad guys didn't all just start killing innocent people as soon as their turns arrived the first time, they waited until Kevdak gave the order this turn. And that's a really nice middle ground, right? It keeps the first or second round of this fight from just being a slaughter where every civilian gets their throat slit, despite the fact that there are other enemy combatants on the field that the herd members should really be focusing on instead. But also, it doesn't ignore the stakes that were established in the previous episode, which was that the bad guys would kill their hostages if the good guys showed up. Dramatically, you can't just ignore that threat that you established in the last game. So unfortunately, at this point, the herd members are starting to execute the remaining civilians in the town square. And that specifically says that the bad guys are killing the civilians to draw the heroes toward them, to draw them out of their hiding places. Now I'm gonna offer a content warning for child's death. Skip to this time code to avoid the topic. But one of the civilians in the town square is a child, something that I don't think was clear to the audience, but it, the players are definitely aware of this before now. And now this child is being killed by the Goliaths. And that clearly weighs heavily on the players, though it's not a hard line or even a veil for them. But Matt did choose to have a child brought into the town square as one of the hostages, and he didn't have to do that. Now, obviously that reflects how evil the bad guys are, but this is something you're gonna wanna make sure your players are actually okay with, because child death is a hard line for a lot of people. Anyway, rounding out this round of combat, the bad guys attack some more, Percy gets rocked with a few attacks, and Vax gets hit with a blight spell from a druid. Round four. Oh Jesus Christ, things are not going well. On Vex's turn, she flies above Kevdak and releases Grog from the locket, so he can drop down and attack. Matt allows Grog to basically have a readied action to attack as he falls. It's not how the rules work because he's already established the time doesn't pass inside the locket, but I think he's starting to realize that mechanically that's going to hinder interesting and exciting options for the players and the NPCs who get trapped inside the locket. He also rules that Grog's rage ended because he spent his turn in the locket. That's basically the trade-off for getting to ready his action. But it also makes it clear that Matt is starting to abandon the idea that time does not pass for the creatures inside the locket. So, Grog, you were released. Shh, falling down to land at, like on top of Kevdak with the blood axe in a downward arc. Yeah, big wind up as we're coming down. Go ahead and roll an attack. Any yeah. chance I can make this reckless? Oh no, no way. Yeah. Natural 20. Look at it. The first one was a Fuck one. You. The that's first a one was a one. Why is it 20s, man? You can't, you can't you gotta stop this. That's a 20, the and first that's why one was he did a reckless. one. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and roll damage on this. 42, nice. means it is 21 damage. How do you want to do that? Yes! 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 Yes!
As you, oh. as the shadow fires from the necklace as she holds it aloft, bleeding and shaking, you appear and dive down in silence. Oh my god! The whole square coming towards you as Kevdak, clutching in the one nearly ruined arm, the other arm that you bisected, is turning the corner, about to open the door to dive into the house to avoid it. Looks up just in time to see you streaking down. What do you do? I say, four stranger! And I sink the egg right into his necks and pot him perfectly down the middle. Oh. <laughs> the most cathartic, how do you want to do this, in the campaign so far. Arguably the most cathartic one in the entire Vox Machina campaign. Arguably even the most cathartic in the history of Critical Role. I mean, I can certainly think of others that meant more emotionally, but I can't think of any that had this level of a reaction. The next day, when Matt was asked what surprised him about this fight, he said that he was surprised that they brought Kevdak so low, then Greenbird brought him up by 70 hit points, and then the party reduced those hit points away again, so he was still on the tail end of his life. And the final blow was dealt by Grog. That was completely unpredictable, but also narratively perfect. But Grog also only had four hit points left, so he collapses too. And the herd members all gasp and stare in silence. Now Vex wants to fly down and heal the unconscious Grog, but she doesn't have the actions to do so, so she just readies her action. But then, almost as an afterthought, she asks if she can shout something out. Matt says, sure, so Vex shouts, Witness Grog's strong jaw and bend the knee! Yeah, it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great. Make an intimidation check. Honor is death. Next <laughs> I won't hit the table, I was gonna go inspect it. Oh, oh but I trust you guys. I trust you guys. I trust you guys. It's all one. Oh, we have, we have these two sided dice. I saw it. I swear, it's just all ones I swear, and swear on everything. I saw. This is gonna be an interesting night to explain to the internet, guys. Uh, 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 all right. You opened it up to the dice, and oh the my dice God. decided. We witnessed, we witnessed. This is a fascinating moment because look at Matt's face when she says that. He clearly thinks there's a world in which this is possible, but not a slam dunk that the herd will rally behind Grog. But it's still possible. That's why he allows her to roll. And of course, he rolls a natural 20, which is very lucky. But Liam is right. Matt opened it up to the dice. Now, one dice roll, not even a crit, could not make Grog the new ruler of the tribe. This is going to require multiple checks to convince their enemies to fall in line. But the circumstances are on their side. As Matt said repeatedly the next day, Grog is the only one who could have killed Kevdak to end the fight. Anyone else who could kill Kevdak would be essentially just an outsider committing an assassination. But Grog killed Kevdak, and they were just doing a one-on-one -on -one challenge, so now the herd is all asking themselves, wait, was that it? Was that the end of the challenge? It's like the scene in Black Panther when T'Challa comes back from the dead and resumes his challenge to Killmonger, and all of Killmonger's new soldiers have to ask themselves, wait, so what does this mean? Do we keep going, or do we pause and let them hash it out? Except in this case, the fight's over, and the herd has to figure out where they stand without Kevdak influencing their decision. But as I said, this does not convince the herd, not just yet. But Matt does offer a reward for this natural 20. He narrates that Greenbeard shifts back from his earth elemental form into his normal form, as he surveys the broken body of Kevdak in despair. It narratively makes sense, like it's certainly in character for Greenbeard to react that way. And it's also a huge bonus if the combat does continue, because Greenbeard will have no more wild shapes. But also, it's a major sign of successful de-escalation. It's a signal to the players that trying to talk their way out of this isn't just a remote possibility, this is very much on the table. Matt also clarified afterwards that yes, the party rolled a lot of natural 20s, but he believes all of them, even if he didn't see all of them. He specifically said, no one is going to fudge their rolls. Everyone is policing each other's die rolls. I think the reason that he wanted to see Laura's natural 20 was because it's fun to see your players high rolls, to see their dice. But also, I imagine that he knew the audience would likely believe him if he verified the dice were legitimate, but without his ability to confirm that, there would be some doubt. But as he says when they bump the table, he believes that she rolled a natural 20. Vax rushes to Grog's side in case some of the other attackers lunge for Grog again. He's actually standing on top of Kevdak's body, which is a fun detail. And I land on him and I say, Kevdak has fallen. Will you let Strongjaw rise? And I hold my action to attack if they come at me. Matt doesn't ask Vax to roll anything, but the archers all get into position to shoot him and then hold their actions to stand off. On Scantlin's turn, he walks Pike away from the enemy surrounding her and starts chanting, Strong jaw, strong jaw. He's doing this to cast Healing Word and revive Grog, but Matt also calls for a persuasion check. Scantling gets above a 20, low for him, but still pretty good. He also casts Bigby's hand to lift Grog into the air. And good timing because it's Grog's turn. My herd, oh, hear me. Fallen is your mighty leader, Kevdak. 
the very Goliath swine who would have domesticated you like a common household cat, who would have made you bend the knee to a mere dragon. I show you this. And I reach into the bag of holding and I pull out one of the dragon's teeth that is still in there and I toss it into the middle of the square. I do not mean to lead this herd, but rather to empower you to more powerful game. I'm here to inspire your aspirations. Never would I ask you to bend the knee. Only would I ask you to live and fight and perhaps die in the most beautiful death you could possibly attain. Join me and my fellows. Come to our aid when I call. And with that, we will chase down dragons, gods, and more. <laughs> <laughs> I can't play his entire speech here, but man, this is some of Travis's best role playing in the entire campaign. However, he doesn't roll very well here. He only gets like an 11. So the 10 situation continues. He also calls for Xanror, and so Greenbeard calls for them to bring Xanror out. And this is when we see that Xanror is in chains and he has been beaten. They also bring out a chained up half-orc woman who is with child. This is Wara, Xanwar's mate. Xanwar says that he thought the herd had lost its edge and Kevdak had grown docile. He also implies that Greenbeard whispering in his ear was basically an enabler for Kevdak's wayward priorities. According to Greenbeard, Xanwar tried to mutiny but was captured and awaiting punishment. And Greenbeard basically tells Grog to finish the job and hands him the blood axe. Grog also puts on the gauntlets, though he can't attune to them just yet. And then he chooses his words to Xanwar very carefully. Quiet yourself. I've heard enough. And I lift the blood axe and I say, You are a disgrace to this herd. And I will return this herd to power. And I pivot and I drive the blood axe into Greenbeard. Yeah. Oh shit! Roll an attack. Okay. Yeah, you do, Medic. Reckless? If you want to. I will. <clears throat> No, get the fuck out. Natural it's a fucking 20. natural 20. It seems all the poison came from his head, so I'll remove that from his body. <laughs> all of the rest of the herd kind of like moves for a second nervously. I spin and I say, do you see? Do you see what staying in one place does? This is what weakness looks like. Unchain Xanroar. The next day, Matt said that he genuinely didn't know whether Grog would side with Greenbeard or Xanroar. That was a choice about who the party would ally themselves with. Both of them could help with Vox Machina's goals, but it depends on who Grog trusts more and who the others can rally behind. Xanroar is probably going to be a harder sell to the rest of the tribe than Greenbeard would have been, just because Greenbeard had been so established among the leadership of the tribe for so long. But how this goes is actually going to be determined in the next session. The Goliaths unchain Xanroar and he tells the group of herd members that they are going to attack the dragon at dawn the next day. Grog agrees to this, but privately he and Vox Machina agree they need to discuss this later on. They're not sure if they're ready to attack the dragon the next day or not, but either way, they just can't hash this out in front of the herd right now. They take the yes, they take the win, they'll figure out the details later. Now as we learned on the live stream the next day, apparently some folks were frustrated that the bloodthirsty barbarians stopped fighting at all. But first, as Matt pointed out, they're not all barbarians. More importantly, they're not just mindless barbarians. There are other aspects to their culture. They have people they try to protect. Even inside the herd, there is a tenuous relationship with the Rivermaw tribe, so the internal politics might play a role in this. And also, this alliance with Vox Machina is still tenuous. A lot of the herd is feeling this out to see where this might go. Case in point, Xanroar says Vox Machina can walk among the city as equals, but they are still getting mad-dogged by some herd members who are keeping an eye on the party and waiting to see what they do next. Matt also pointed out the next day that Vox Machina got extremely lucky with their dice rolls during this negotiation as well, which helped them a lot in being able to navigate the situation, because this could have gone a lot worse. Also, Matt was asked why none of the Goliaths mentioned Grog's beard, and Matt says, look, they just have not had the chance. These have been some really tense scenarios. They've had other things on their mind. Also, in fairness, Matt probably had other things on his mind as well. He might have just forgotten that the Goliaths haven't seen Grog with a beard yet. At this point, Matt asks, what do you want to do? And I sort of blink at that and say, wait, are we not ending the episode here? Because it seems like the best place to end was reminding the players, hey, you have a tenuous truce with the herd. We'll pick up there next time. We're three hours into an episode that really only runs another 20 minutes. So it's not exactly like Matt felt the game would have ended too early if they'd stopped here. Now, I do like where they wind up ending things, but 
I'm not sure how much of that was even planned by Matt or not. Because basically, the party loots Kevdak's corpse, and Grog requests a couple of trophies besides the Titanstone Knuckles and the Blood Axe. He requests Kevdak's skull and the section of skin that featured the bear tattoo. Vax gathers up most of the bodies and burns them to lay them to rest. Except for one. Now returning to the subject of child death, skip here to avoid it. They examine the body of the child who died in combat, and Pike begins a ritual to raise him from the dead. And Matt does still ask for a ritual, like whenever they bring a party member back to life, where three party members work together to bring this child back. Pike casts the spell and rolls a 24. Keyleth tries to use her natural healing magic and rolls a natural 1. And Percy sings along in Celestial and rolls a 21. Now, Taliesin had the best description for his contribution because he had a clear idea for how he could help. Inspired by how Matt described, Pike's ritual involved elements of the celestial language, which Percy realized, oh, I know that language. But certainly this ritual isn't as emotional or impactful as the typical resurrection efforts we get on Critical Role. Not to speak ill of the dead, but this is a character that the party members don't really have a ton of emotional investment in besides the superficial level. And these scenes are the most powerful when they're driven by emotions. Now, Matt also doesn't do his final role behind the screen, so the three roles are enough to bring the child back to life. Now that child is alive again, he tells them that he was pulled from his home and separated from his family, who were not in the town square. He also says that he lives up by the temples. And that's interesting, because that's also where Pike's great-great-grandfather, Wilhand, lives. So this is kind of like Matt saying, hey, you can try to go find Wilhand now. His home is in the same direction as where you need to go to help this kid, so maybe that's something you could try to do next week. They also know that they have to go and loot something valuable from Master Qual's house, and have a very important conversation with Xanroar about the plan to fight the dragon tomorrow. Especially because, as we'll see in the next episode, the players are not all of the same mind about that. Grog also tells the Goliath to go and empty their prisons, though that is something that we're going to talk about in a future episode as well. But, once again, a few herd members are eyeballing them as they move through the town to go return this child home. And that's where they end the session. But then they just take a minute to celebrate that they didn't die. And Matt does a great job of highlighting the contributions of the players and celebrating their successes. We didn't die! We didn't die. I, I seriously believe, I thought we were we all die. gonna die. Could when it, uh, when he got Could healed have. and everything yep. was running. Yep. I was just, I was like, yeah, I mean, we, we might had well him. It cool, because we're dead. Then it flipped and it was gone. And we were And like, then we snaked it out of the fire. But we there had was them no on the run. He, by the way, on that whole person, the cutting Gambling. words whole person, yeah. like, Dude, that's yes, exactly what that. Up for the fucking bard. <laughs> what? Evdak hadn't used his action surge yet. Action oh surge? My what does that do? It's, multi, it's, what, it's, what, it's what I do, what he does. you can take an extra extra action. You do four, four action. attacks in one he round with the blood axe. Did he ever get to attack? Uh, no. No, yeah. no never. His couldn't make his save. Gone. His arms were gone by the time he came around. Could have oh shoulda, woulda, kept dog. Could have no. his arms you off did. him. <laughs> Brilliant. It was really good. And honestly, kind of, kind of mucking it up with the archers kind of helped too, because they were all about to just start focus firing on whoever was visible. Yeah. Oh. So I'm glad we split them up. Durns getting Grog durns. out. Oh, so look, some, getting Grog out was key. You if you hadn't command? pulled her, if you hadn't pulled them out and taken all those tax opportunity, that was it. You would be gone. I was at twenty. They weren't. Like, they weren't going to stop when you hit zero. No, no, that would have been. Yeah. They were going to cut you up until you were dead. Yeah. Yep. Oh my god. Yeah, that would have been the end of it. Look at that. That guy. was that was a really <laughs> play. Oh, look at the face. You saw it too, <laughs> yeah, didn't you? The, the shadow of a man that wished he could have butchered <laughs> no, <that was> someone <laughs> and didn't quite get to. That is the face uh, of the fucking The devil. shadow of Craven Edge <laughs> lived <laughs> by its It's okay. It's a bunch of dudes. You guys have dragons to deal okay. with. Oh god. I'm so excited. This is so important, and Matt did it a lot again in his live stream the next day. He celebrated the players and the tactics they were able to pull off. Sure, they had some extremely good roles, but they were also smart. And even though I know Matt was probably kind of bummed that he never really got to take Kebdak for a spin and highlight everything cool he could do, I would argue that Kebdak's ability to take half damage from just about every damage source turned out to be extremely relevant in this encounter. But even more importantly, Matt didn't lose this fight. Okay, actually, I was about to say, Matt didn't lose this fight because of poor dice rolls, he lost it due to the players executing some genuinely good strategies. But actually, Matt didn't lose this fight. Kevdak did. And yeah, that might sound glib, but I think it's really important to remember, especially if you're running a campaign like Matt Mercer's, where the story is really important. Matt wants them to beat Kevdak, but he wants to make it a challenge. And that's especially tough when he's learning a new system, and he's doing so at higher levels without gradually easing into them through low-level play. And it's also still a pretty new system at this point, and so most people just aren't as familiar with it yet with what it does well and where it falls short. Honestly, if his party hadn't rolled seven natural 20s, they probably wouldn't have survived. Then again, Matt rolled nine, so it's not exactly like he was having the worst night either. Thanks, Crit Roll Stats. We miss you dearly. You are doing amazing work, and having your archives available while I work on this series is invaluable. 
The next day, Matt also brought up a terrific point, one that I wish I'd touched on in the last episode in this series. He says that when Grog drew Kevdak out into the open and relied on his friends to help in this fight, Matt basically considers that to be the culmination of Grog's character arc about where he finds his strength. And Craven Edge was a huge part of that. After all, Grog was effectively juicing. He was using this artificial and dangerous method to boost his strength when he should have been relying on his friends to help him in battle more than his own physical strength. And that's honestly something most of us could seek to remember, that we don't need to be the strongest or the most powerful because we're all part of a team. In a way, this is a lesson to Grog, not to Travis, but to Grog, to make sure that he never suffers from main character syndrome. Not something that he was in particular danger of falling into, but still an incredible subplot to watch play out, as something that I think about all the time when I run or play in these types of games. And with that, we're out. <sighs> what an episode. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back in two weeks with a new Critical World Demystified episode to talk about episode 53, At Dawn We Plan. This is some of my favorite moments of character interaction, and I am so excited to get to this one. In the meantime, please like and subscribe, ring the bell, share the video with a friend, comment, do all the YouTube stuff, feed the ever-hungry sentient weapon that is the YouTube algorithm. You can also... Algorithm? I'll phrase it that way. You can also support the channel by signing up for my Patreon or becoming a YouTube member, and you'll get cool bonuses for joining. Join my Discord server to hang out with other awesome people, and sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date with updates. I'm going to try to use that more, I swear. Click here to watch my video about Initiative Tense. I'm really proud of that one, but it's not exactly the kind of video the YouTube algorithm necessarily prefers, so please show it some love. I'd appreciate it. Until next time, play fair and have fun.